Okay, so think about this. Root 25 minus x squared minus 3 must be greater than or equal to 0 given these conditions. Okay? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. I can move this over by adding. And there's a clever move you can make. Usually, you can't square both sides of an inequality because of the whole nature of is it negative, is it positive? But root 25 minus x squared is always positive, or at least it's always positive or zero. Because look, that's the function. It exists above the x-axis. 3, always positive. So you can square both sides if you know that the left hand and right hand side are both positive. And it doesn't screw up the direction of the inequality symbol. All right, at this point, you can subtract 25 from both sides. And you get negative 16. Divide by, divide by negative 1. That flips this symbol. And you've got x squared is less than or equal to 16. All right, so keep in mind here with x squared compared to 16 that you can, let me just check on something really quick. You can take this and actually move the 16 to the left hand side. Think about x squared minus 16 is less than or equal to 0. If 25 minus x squared gives me something that looks like this, x squared minus 16 kind of reverses the roles. Instead of doing a like, a like an enclosure, this one pushes things outside. So the graph for that looks like this. And I know you guys haven't seen this before, but I just want to give you the visual that x squared minus 16 from the perspective of if this were a square root, it does that. Um, although there is no square root around this, so I'm not quite sure why I'm showing you that. Okay, bottom line, x squared minus 16 looks like this as a parabola, and it's less than or equal to zero between these two points. Okay, sorry, I almost completely butchered that explanation. Maybe I did, but I think I've recovered. So, where is this? less than or equal to 0 between negative 4 and 4. So what is the, I guess, what's the shared space between, it's got to be from negative 5 to 5, but it's also got to be from negative 4 to 4. Here's the shared space. That ends up being the final answer. So from negative 4 to 4, that's going to be part B's domain on number 39. Yeah, OK. Sorry. I was just double checking. Thirty-seven gets a little hairier. So you got two square roots there, as you can see. Yeah. So we'll do the first part over here. F of g of x for thirty-seven. Our f is root x minus 2, so it's root g of x minus 2. Keeping in mind that our pre-existing condition is that x plus 5 must be greater than or equal to 0. 
So x must be greater than or equal to negative 5. We're just keeping this in our back pocket for now. So when the time comes to make our final decision, we got to factor that into it. So the g of x part, we put a root x plus 5 inside the radical. So we set that greater than or equal to 0, this whole thing. The procedure, by the way, in case I have kind of overlooked this, explaining it, this is the domain. So again, we can compare 2 with a root, especially if we know what the graph looks like. So consider the graph root x plus 5 versus 2. We talked about this back in Math 3 and then reviewed it back in pre-calc. Maybe you've forgotten it, and this is just a refresher, but shift it left five units. This is what the square root looks like of x plus 5. Now the question is, when is that greater than or equal to 2? So a horizontal line at y equals 2. And you know what? It seems to be the place where the line y equals 2 equals the curve y equals root x plus 5 meet. And then it's just going to be greater than or equal to that number. And that's pretty much what's happening here. So, so it's like you could almost, you could almost say, Hey, figure out where these two curves intersect each other, which is, which is an easy squaring of both sides. Okay? You get x plus 5 equals 4. Subtract 1 from both sides. Bingo. Negative 1 is the place where they meet, and it's everything bigger than or equal to negative 1. So I didn't quite do that with a nice, neat, like, clearly algebra approach, but... As you can see, if you know a thing or two about graphs, it can be very helpful in sort of like giving a backdoor explanation for something like that. So they meet at negative 1. Root x plus 2 is always higher than or has a, has a larger y value when it's bigger than or equal to negative 1. So that's where we have to combine our two answers. We gotta ask ourselves, all right, what is the intersection of x is greater than or equal to negative one and x is greater than or equal to negative five? There's negative five, there's negative one. They're both going to, I guess, positive infinity as their value, uh, at least they're approaching it. And the shared space is everything from negative 1 on. So there's our domain for f of g. Check out g of f. Uh, g of f is pretty much doing the same thing. I mean, you got, you got root x plus 5. f of x is in there f of x's pre-existing condition was the fact that it was root x minus 2, which gives us x is greater than or equal to 2 as its domain. All right. So here's the pre-existing domain condition. And then f of x is root x minus 2. So same moves that we did back there. Root x minus 2 plus 5 must be greater than or equal to 0. You can do a similar comparison by saying subtract the 5 from both sides. Root x minus 2 is greater than or equal to negative 5. If we're not sure about the whole squaring of both sides, we can use a geometric interpretation of things by graphing a square root function that's shifted right to and then comparing it, where is it greater than or equal to negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? It's always greater than or equal to negative 
one, two, three, four, five. Always above it. This is always true. So it doesn't matter uh, what value I plug in there, this will always work, except all the values that are less than two. That's all the places it doesn't work. So it's kind of like always true should sort of push us in the direction of all real numbers. But then we have to keep in mind the, the, the restriction given to us by our first domain that we plugged in. So there's the domain for g of f. Let's see if I have number, uh, bleh. let's see if I have enough time to start with a new section. Number 43 is the next one on the list. All right, yes, I believe we can talk through this. And it's still frozen, I see that. It says find a composite function form for y. So you got y is equal to x squared plus 3x to the 1 third power. Now this is a complete mystery at this point. Like, what is it even asking you to do? Well, I think in the reading it showed you a few examples of how you can, you can take a complex function and then rewrite it in terms of two simpler functions. Here's what they're getting after. Um, you see the, the fractional exponent right here? Yeah, we can manipulate that. We can say, hey, let's let one of the functions be, let's x to the 1 third power, and you know what, I'm not even going to use the x because there's x's in here. Let's say, let u to the 1 third power, sort of like, let that be the function that, that receives the x squared plus 3x. All right. Let u to the one third be the function that gets the plug-in. Let's let that be the f of x. And really now we have to talk about it in terms of x because it was f of x. Meanwhile, the x squared plus 3x is sort of like our inside function. We're going to call that g of x. So I'm going to, it's not really a U term, it's, it's, they've all got to be in terms of X to the one third. So if I've got F of X equals X to the one third and G of X equals X squared plus three X, what, what I've created here is I've created a system in which I can say F of G of X should be plug G of X x squared plus 3x wherever I see an x in the original function. So it's like saying g of x to the one-third power. I'll use the caret for the one-third. <clears throat> and that's exactly what it is. It's x squared plus 3x to the one-third. That's how, I believe that's what they're getting after. Yeah, well, they wrote it a little bit differently, but that's the concept we're kind of moving forward. So our f of x is x to the one-third. Our g of x is x squared plus 3x. Got it. So then when you see 49, I think this will be a really quick, quick move. Think about root x plus 4 as the plug-in function. So it's like I'm plugging in root x plus 4 into a function that has placeholders in the numerator and the denominator. Those placeholders would be x and then minus 2 over x plus 2. And therefore, this is going to be f of g of x.